Okay, so again, so Oren uh, has beautifully introduced the two of us, and so we're just going to go right into the next part of our presentation slide. And it didn't advance, so Denise, you have to advance. Thank you. So we just did the introductions um, you know, of, of ourselves, but I'm not really sure how many of you know about culturally relevant teaching. And if you do, just use your reactions to put your thumbs up or a uh, or, uh, um, celebration symbol or whatever, smiley face, uh, just to kind of get a little bit of a sense of the audience that we're working with. Okay, that was a hard, thank you, Candice. <laughs> So some of you know about it and some of you don't, which is fine because we wanted to actually center our session to talk about what is culturally relevant teaching. So we will do that. And then we're going to marry culturally relevant teaching and sustainability teaching. So also, how many of you have a good grasp of what sustainability teaching is? But so um, use your reactions again. A few more wonderful, wonderful. I will suspect that since this has been a sustainability group, right? So, but we actually gonna try to marry those two together to actually enhance a little bit more about what it means to do sustainability teaching, but then to, to help you to understand a little bit more about what is culturally relevant teaching. So we're gonna have a couple of activities for you all to engage in. So we'll put you in breakout rooms so you can have a little bit small, intimate conversations with one another. And Denise and I can pop into your rooms um, to be able to hear in a little bit. But even when you get to your groups, you'll have a chance to do um, some note taking and then come back and share it with a large group in our reporting out session. And we'll have a final Q&A just to see what other things are coming out. And we're also going to give you like a little bit of a call to action to think about what are your next steps. Next slide. So prior to the workshop, I sent to you all or I had access for you all to have these two articles that were present. These are two pieces that I've done over time. One, the first one talks a little bit more about how do you start to, to open up your classroom for culturally relevant teaching to kind of think about the, the diversity that you have of the students that are in your classroom. It's very teacher friendly. I wrote it for a teacher audience. And then the second one is much more of a research focused article that I did with one of my doctoral students and some other colleagues at Teachers College at the time. Um, they actually think about the action behind what does it mean to be able to learn science, collect data, uh, and, and have much more of a personal connection to that. So if you don't have access to these two resources, um, definitely email us and we can send them to you. Um, they're actually, we're going to send you also a PowerPoint presentation a little bit later, and they're actually linked in the PowerPoint presentation. So you'll have access to those as well. Um, next slide. So this is the foundation that I've been using. So Gloria Lassen Billings' ideas of culturally relevant teaching. It came from research that she actually did with um, teachers looking at the success of black um, teachers who were successful teaching black students in classrooms. And this has been foundational to the work that I do as a teacher educator. It was also foundational to my work as a secondary science teacher before I even knew what this framework was. So to me, that just tells me how powerful of a framework it is. But she has three different pillars. So talking about what is culturally relevant teaching. And I'm going to go into all three centered on student achievement, cultural competence, and critical content. So that's the pillar of the different ones that she works with. I've done these, uh, I've done this culturally relevant teaching framework in my research, and you can read about that as well. If I could uh, definitely can give you resources around that too. But I find that they are also really interesting to overlay them with uh, sustainability, sustainability teaching. So next slide. So here they are together, just a little bit of a briefing about them. So I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about them. And then at the end of the session, we're gonna come back and return to this to see how, how well they are implemented or integrated with sustainability. But she talks about academic success. And this is very different from how educators have come to think about assessment and teaching and, and all that kind of like standardized teaching and, or standardized testing. But she's really talking about the heart of what students do in the classroom when they're learning the content area. So my content area being science. So what does it mean to be able to uh, allow students to come to a classroom and are excited about learning in the classroom? They want to know the content. They are investing in 
and learning the content. So she talks about this idea of student learning being academically successful in that particular way. Doesn't It has very little to do with, as I said, the standardized tests that we get to give to students. It has much more to do about the passion and the desire to want to learn and want to know. So ask yourself that question. Are you setting up your classrooms where students come in and they genuinely are excited about learning the content in your classroom? The second one is cultural competence. So this is when the curriculum is able to build upon students on um, backgrounds, their, 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 their funds of knowledge. Now, what do students have that you are able to use in a classroom? This becomes critical for teachers because oftentimes in the curriculum, it does not ask students their, you know, what, what their backgrounds are. It doesn't uh, account for what students know uh, from their personal experiences or even from watching television or the, the funds of knowledge they have within their own communities and their own environments. And so how do you pay attention to that? How do you bring that into the classroom environment for students to learn? So she talks about this idea of cultural competence. It also allows individuals in the classroom to get to know each other. So not only are you learning about yourself, you're also learning about the collective environment that you have within the classroom. And then thirdly, which is really important, and this is out, and oftentimes um, people say that this is the hardest one to do in a classroom setting, but this notion of critical consciousness. So this has to do with social political consciousness, um, you know, the bigger things that we think about uh, outside of ourselves, the larger context in which we live. And so it's like, how do you go, how do you critique those norms, those values, and those things that are out there even bigger and beyond yourself? But she says, oh, this part is extremely hard. But what I've been able to do in my work if students are coming to the classroom and they are academically successful they want to learn the content uh, they're being critically conscious uh, or having cultural, sorry, cultural competence about themselves then they start to ask questions these are those deep questions that oftentimes um, teachers run away from but students have these really deep questions about well why is it happening in this particular way or why are we doing it this particular way? And I really feel like this is where sustainability teaching comes into play. And so here is like, we wanna be able to have opportunities for students to critique this knowledge that they are actually producing. It's like, it's not that I'm giving it to them. It's like the information is in front of them. What do they do with that information? What are these questions they now start to ask? And then as teachers or educators, and how do we help them to answer those questions? And if you really think about it and set back a minute, students are asking questions that are really deep complex and complicated and we cannot run away from that and so to me this is where i really see uh sustainability coming into play because we we'll all know the pillars and how they're all integrated so really for this idea of looking at culturally relevant teaching these three different tenets that Gloria Lassen Billings has set are foundational to my work and what I think about when I do curriculum development, when I'm doing teacher education with my students, but now it's giving me this, uh, this additional energy to be able to think about it outside of science education and to think about sustainability. And this is also what we're gonna have you all to do in the workshop. So go to the next slide, please, Denise. And Diddy's has this slide. <laughs> yes, just to, um, briefly, uh, thank you, Felicia, for um, sharing those valuable um, points on culturally re relevant pedagogy. So now we're going to kind of switch into the sustainability component of you know what that means in terms of classroom instruction. So um, perhaps um, most of you are familiar with this. Um, this intersection of what sustainability is in terms of the environment, social and economic issues. But <clears throat> we understand the limitations of uh, how this uh, takes place in terms of needs of individuals and communities versus you know, the limitations that they have in terms of their, their actions and behaviors. So there's um, I've seen examples of the three spheres that includes a fourth sphere that is in culture. And um, so this is even more critical now where we are seeing the effects of global climate change <clears throat> and having students have that critical consciousness of really sort of exploring what is happening in their communities. So this actually shows a more interdisciplinary uh, approach to the field of inquiry. And it focuses on specific problems at the perhaps at the community level, um, at the national level, local, national, and even and even the global level. But in terms of schools and teaching, it really, really supports 
um, place-based and project-based learning. So place-based and project-based learning is where students are actually, um, they are actively involved in identifying problems in their communities. They are the ones that are actually doing the work, uh, doing the research. It is, it, is, um, it is designed to have students go beyond the scope of the classroom where they're going out is not just a, a simple project. It is something that they are really sort of actively involved in solving community-based problems that exist in, <clears throat> in their surroundings. So this is the important component. Now, where you see in marries where the sustainability practices um, marries with the um, cultural relevant pedagogy. So we're going to switch into our first task. Um, and what does sustainability means to you? And we're going to have you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, record some statements in a Padlet. Uh, do we have the link we can put in the chat, uh, Felicia? Now, when I say what sustainability means to you, think about, about that role as an educator, perhaps as a parent, perhaps as a business owner, and we're gonna to get to a, a separate task, but I'd like for you to really sort of um, <clears throat> um, think about what that means to you. The link is in the chat. So just click on the link in the chat and um, and start populating um, what does it means to you. And then we're going to take a minute to just kind of look at those definitions. Where's all this? Can you access the Padlet? Okay, good. Felicia, do you want me to switch over to the, the Padlet or can, could you, sh I'll stop sharing and you. Yeah, um, you can stop sharing. I'm in the Padlet now. Okay. May I just suggest one thing? Um, is it possible for those who feel more comfortable to express themselves in Hebrew or another language to write it in another language and we'll do some translation? Of course, definitely. <laughs> that is the component of cultural competence. <laughs> <laughs> we are applying what we just learned. We are just applying yes. it. Yes, <laughs> Okay, and we do see different ones coming in. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, everybody. Thank you for this. And while you're in the Padlet, do take a moment to look at some of the responses from other people. And do you notice if their responses are similar to yours or even think about um, collectively, what are we as a group, how are we defining sustainability?
-hmm. Yeah, these are wonderful. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can go. We can go to the next one, Denise. Um, as the Padlet is filling in, because we will come back to these at the end. And so here is kind of a concentric circles to kind of pull all this together. So looking at this ideas of sustainability is based on the personal, the local, the national, the regional, and the global. And I think this is what makes it also very challenging to think about what is sustainability because it's got all these different parts that are connected to it. And so if you look at the circles like self as an individual and a member of society, we can make actions ourselves like individual, like, I, like choosing to recycle. You know, so then like, okay, what if my family is recycling? Then what if the entire community is recycling? How do we think about if everybody in the nation was doing recycling, what does that mean for the earth, for the environment, uh, for resources? And then what about the world? And so it, it, so all these different layers are connected, but we also know that they are um, influencing each other also in positive and negative ways. So it's almost like a push and a pull. You pull on one end and it may have an effect on another end. And so it's really hard to be able to think about this. And so I think as teachers and educators, we want to be able to have those kinds of discussions with our children. And I think this is where that, that part around the critical consciousness comes into play. Uh, I'm just gonna tell one short story of an activity that I did with my students in an elementary classroom. And we were doing, we were talking about pollution. And so we, the question was asked, well, who, you know, wh wh why do we have all this pollution in New York City? And she was saying like, well, I think the garbage people are doing it. And so her idea was like, it wasn't me, it was the garbage people. Like they're not picking up the trash that are on the streets. And they're like, well, who is putting the trash on the streets? And then where do you think this trash is going? Some years ago, there was this story in New York City about this, about the, um, about the trash, um, I just lost the word, what is it? Um, it's not a, bar I would say barrage. What is that bit? Barge, is a barge, barge. Uh, going across the city trying to figure out where they're gonna put their trash. And, and so we know like they're um, you know, sending it to other places, like taking responsibility for what we produce. And so again, it becomes like the self, the community, the nation, the world. There, are, um, there were times even thinking like, well, let's just send it to another country. Oh, no. And often where does this trash go to countries who are already uh, under resourced and also have other particular kinds of issues, but it was the trash that we initially produced right from my house from my community and all of that. So again, this idea of how connected we are and these circles that we have that are, are overlapping one another makes it even more critical for us to think about our, our, our place in the world. And I see that many of you are talking about that in your in the panelists about this connections to um, the self in the world. So we're going to talk about this about giving you all a, a, an activity to help you to think about your individual role and the implications of that a little bit later. But before that, the other thing that we are uh, that we're that's connected to our work is like data. We're a scientist, so we love data. Uh, but how do you look at that data to get understanding and meaning out of it? How do you look at that data to be able to um, relay information that's going on in the world so that we can understand these ideas around cultural relevancy as well as sustainability. So Denise is gonna go into um, a website. I think it's the next slide if we're not out of order. Yep, um, to talk about what this looks like. So Denise. Right, hi. So um, so think about uh, this. This example that I'm pre presenting to you, uh, the data comes from environmental <clears throat> data portal for New York City. And um, as you look at the data, right, you see there are two, um, we selected two neighborhoods in New York City, the Upper East Side, which is probably a more affluent um, neighborhood, and the South Bronx, which is considered to be uh, a more uh, poor marginalized um, communities. And this data is from child, child um, asthma rates. And as you can see, look at the, what the data tells you, but let's talk about what, what, what does this story tell in terms of our um, teaching? So 
we usually perhaps in um, as a scientist, we want students to understand the nature of the respiratory system. Then we may talk about, oh, what happens when you have asthma? What does that mean uh, to the body? But then when you talk about the more cultural relevant issues that speaks to this data, students will now be required to ask questions. Okay, why do we have such high asthma rates in our communities? They probably have family members who have suffered from asthma. So going beyond the, the, the specific content strands that speaks to what happens to the body with asthma, but then why? Why is, is, is my neighborhood suffering so much or my community suffers, suffering so much from high asthma rates? They begin to ask these questions. These are the socio-political issues that you want students to raise that consciousness within students. I'll give you now a quick example. Uh, just recently, I think it was in the New York Times, what they're noticing is this is as, as a result of gentrification. So more and more you have uh, folks are ordering groceries to be delivered into their communities. So in these communities where you never had massive um, delivery trucks bringing in tons and tons of groceries. So these trucks are now idling and letting out all this, you know, um, this 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 spewing out you know exhaust and so now it is now contributing to a much higher um asthma rates that they're noticing that this just this alone because of gentrification the the ripple effects of that so this is another example how students can really look at the changes that's happening in their communities and what is it that they can do to be better um, to addressing these issues and become um, problems also, but also the socio-political issues that, have, that are causing these issues. That's what we want to drive that consciousness among students. Here's another set of data. This is indoor air quality, the same community. So this is the power of data where you present students um, the information and ask them to apply the inquiry inquiry-based strategies for them to explore why is this happening? So it's at the, we, we go back to that circle, um, those sets of circles, um, the individual, the family, the community, the nation, all right? So it really is important for us to kind of present students with the information for them to really sort of understand the context of problems that they're, that they're that's happening in their communities and also become problem solvers. So here, the place-based and problem-based um, strategies are really sort of a, a key for students to do that. Um, so now uh, we're going to segue. So this is the environmental data portal, and I'm not sure uh, if you have access to such um, information in your own um, countries, but it's really sort of a, a, a great resource uh, where th they have resources for teachers and you can get all this data. Uh, um, maybe I could just kind of, uh, do we have time, Felicia, to just kind of quickly show how, okay, so let me go to the, the actual portal. So you can do, you can explore the data, you can go to neighborhood reports. I usually like the neighborhood reports. Um, so I looked at asthma and environment, you could do climate and health, um, any of these things, outdoor air and health, and you can choose the neighborhoods in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, different neighborhoods. You could uh, put in your zip codes. You could highlight all the different various um, neighborhoods and uh, just to see what is happening with regards to these environmental health factors. So this is another, <clears throat> uh, a valuable resource that um, that you could use to really sort of have students look at what's happening in their communities as far as, far as um, environmental health issues. So let me go back to our slides. Um, and I think again, too, as Denise is pulling that back up, um, you know, noticing again and looking at the data. And I think, again, this is an important part that we uh, want students to have a skill to be able to do. 
I mean, even case in point of today, or how much data has been coming out about COVID. So for students to have this critical awareness of what this data means and for them to interpret it themselves, uh, this is just really important to be able to think about how do we as teachers and educators offer data to students for them to make sense of it and to help them to see what these numbers are telling us so that they can go back and uh, refute fake news, you know, fake data and all of that. We want them to be able to develop that particular kind of skill. And so, um, so as Denise shared the, the portal, we, um, we are actually gonna share with you uh, momentarily um, the slides that we just talked about, but it's also gonna lead us into our next activity. So I think it's the next slide, Denise. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> no, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Let me go back. Oops, let me stop sharing. I think I made an error here. That's okay. So as she's pulling back. that back up, I'll just give you a little bit of direction of what we want you to do. Okay, so we're there gonna we go. Have you do, we're going to have you do a role play activity. Um, we're going to put you into breakout groups and in your group, you're going to be assigned a, a, speci a specific role. Um, and then what you're going to do in that particular role is look up the data, which you all have access to momentarily, uh, and, and be able to tell us from your particular role, there it is, from your particular role um, and looking at your perspectives around sustainability, what does that mean uh, for, for a particular issue? So it's, it's very open-ended, and we did that on purpose, but you're going to be able to look at the, uh, the world quality data uh, that we have for you, look around it. And, but you're looking in the perspective of being a small business owner or being an environmentalist or being a teacher or educator. So you'll know when we put you in the breakout groups. You will have also uh, a Google slide where you can put your information as you relate to this, these ideas around the uh, world, world air quality uh, in your particular role. Uh, when we come back, you'll be able to share out a little bit about well, what does sustainability mean to you for this particular role that you're playing? And you can also be creative and say, well, what other kinds of issues in your particular role would you look for? So we're leaving it extremely very open um, because this is an open inquiry. But it's going to also allow you all to talk with each other. This is an opportunity for you to share, to develop your own kind of like sense of uh, cultural competence around this particular issue. So I'm going to put in the um, chat the slides so you all can get to this particular PowerPoint. Of, uh, and you also have the information that we just shared also a little bit earlier. Um, but Oren is going to assist us in putting you all in um, breakout rooms. Um, I think he, or you can just randomly put them in there. If you just set up eight rooms and whatever the numbers fall out, you're going to go into and go into that room. Uh, and then Denise and I will hop in and out of the rooms as well to see how well you all are doing. Are there any questions before you disperse into your rooms? Um, Felicia, do you, do you want to take questions about the specific task or questions about everything we discussed so far? Um, they can, yes, you all can ask about this particular task, but we will have time at the very end to come back to go through everything. Yeah. But if you have so any immediate one, questions, you can take those. So, um, so there was one question in the um, chat. Um, people are asking, who is responsible for collecting such kind of data? If that's a question that the student will ask, for example, where this data is coming from? Do we know? I think it's the uh, the Environmental Protection um, Agency uh, because it's a requirement that this data is um, must become available. Um, I'm not sure if it's a federal law, um, but the Environmental Health Portal was only set up like maybe a few years ago. It wasn't like, uh, and they've gotten a little bit more um, sophisticated with the data and um, the arrangement and the uh, um, much more user-friendly from what was in the past. Yeah. So okay. a lot of governmental agencies will have lots of data, you know, anyway. So any, any data that, um, that you feel like could be helpful in terms of trying to even learn about um, sustainability, there are many, many places where you can obtain that data, uh, whether it's local organizations who will be collecting data, um, world organizations um, um, could be collecting data. So I think this is the point that we really do want to emphasize, like what is that data that's already out there that's readily available that you can go in and use to help you to um, teach this information to students to develop those ideas of relevancy. Um, 
I think is really important. So we, um, is there a particular link to the war? Yes, um, in the um, activity of the slides that are sent to you, you have direct access to the website to be able to look at. So Oren, if you can set up the eight rooms. I see, I see one quick question from uh, Kiara, go ahead. Kiara. Oh, hello. Um, my question is when we're in our small breakout rooms and we're looking at the data from um, different uh, perspectives, will mm -hmm. our group take on one perspective or identity or multiple identities? You're only gonna take on one. So that's gonna make it challenging because we already know it overlaps, but we're gonna come back and talk about the overlaps um, when, when we um, come back as a group. So um, if you can write down um, the number, do we have the number? Yeah, we have the number on the slide, but yeah. So if you go to breakout number one, you're gonna be small business owner. If you break out number two, you're the environmentalist, you know, all of that. Um, three, the teacher, four, the household or family, uh, five, an indigenous person, six, a middle school student, seven will be the local government, and then eight will be a multinational company, multinational corporation. Okay. So, uh, so um, just to be clear, uh, Felicia, so they're doing, are they going to do the two tasks, the one with the the, the various identities and looking at the air quality data? Yes, you're looking at the air quality data as if you were a business owner or as okay. if you were an environmentalist. And so you there's a slide, there's a blank slide for each one of the different breakout groups. And you put your notes based upon what your category is. Because when we come back in large group, we're going to talk about what is your perspective or how did you look at this ward quality data from that particular mm -hmm. perspective? Okay. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Welcome back. This is just a reminder uh, to mute yourself so we can have a conversation. Felicia, I think most of the people are back, so we can start. Okay. So um, what I want to do is like, um, we're not going to have the time to go into a really deep discussion about what you all did, but we, but I can see um, the the great questions and content that you all have in your in your Google Drive slide. But I do want us to talk about the process that you went through to think about your particular role, and you can unmute yourselves and talk about, or maybe give a little bit of summation about what your group talked about. But um, but I want to hear I want to hear some voices at this particular time. The map actually help us to understand the um, powers, I believe it called, the powers that happen. Why it's read in one place and not read in other place. Uh, if it's mountain uh, that and you can breathe or something. And, um, Okay, until here. <laughs> but we 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 were the um, the company, the big company. So we wanted to ma maximum our profits, but we want to uh, we we want that it will be people that live to buy our product. So we want them to be to be a healthy and good life. So it's came from here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And even to think about like, I think you had a really nice way of thinking about a company being responsive, but how many companies are not, you know? So those are other things that you can bring out to students and like actually looking at data from companies as well to overlap some of the other data that you have and to talk about how some of these companies are being responsive to, the, to, to particular kinds of issues around uh, climate change or around sustainability, you know, all these other things, but what companies are not. And then you want to be able to think about, I'm going to I'll give you, well, I'll say it now for the sake of time, but you know, how do we even help students to think about how do they act against that? Or how do you even um, to talk to their families about 
boycotting companies of that sort. I, I used to boycott people all the time, even though we may have been only my, my um, private way of being able to do it. But it was like, you know, you're not going to get my money. So that's the economic because I don't, I don't believe the things that you all are doing. And so those are ways that we can also start to look at that data. And to me, the next step is how do you take action around some of that? Uh, and we can start young people doing that kind of doing that kind of work. So thank you. If your name is Shin, Chin. Chin. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm also Southern, so I pronounce and say things Southern. Yeah, so fine, that's fine. Fine. <laughs> Southern meaning being in the Southern we, part of you. We decide. Uh, we decide to make um, a, 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 with the people of the society and the schools uh, to explain them the uh, importance of uh, the saving. This make make the sustainability. To be so, uh, it's kind of awareness uh, that we wanted to be and do and say. Thank you so much for that. Is there another group that wants to um, talk about okay. their? Uh, oh, I, yes. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. All right, group two. Shout out to uh, the environmentalists. All right, so we just looked at the map and tried to understand it first um, based on the colors and the chart. Um, and then after we uh, gained a better understanding, we looked at various regions within the world um, and then just talked about our observations. And then what we did after that was because we're from all over the world, we, we talked about our own experiences. I know we had some shout out to Israel. Israel. We had some uh, people from Israel talk about um personal like uh reasons why the air quality might be the way it is and and i, I they let us know that it could be political reasons as well, well as population density and where people are located mm -hmm. and Thank so we that. went larger to smaller yes 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 thank you for that and let's get one more group so hi Hi. Hi, yes. Um, group four, we had the household and family. And it was interesting. We, we started as well looking at the various charts. We focused in on one of our members' um, community, which was Mott Haven. And we were able to see exactly how the air quality of that particular area was. And we got some personal experiences from that um, individual about certain um, experiences they have with students, which were actually related to this air quality. So, for example, some students missing classes because of um, asthma problems. And we, we, through all of the dissecting that we did um, and looking at how the air quality could affect the household and the family, we realized that it really had a, an economic strain on the family in particular, in terms of if it is that you have to now have certain insurance coverage, you have to pay certain medical bills because of, let's say, increases in lung disease, cardiovascular diseases, um, asthma, then it puts a strain on families which are already strained. And um, one, one other thing that came up to was the food security issue um, in that area. And so that puts a further strain on the food security issue as well. So it was interesting that we, we saw a direct link between sustainability and air quality and economic, um, the economic impact it actually could have on families. Thank you, Hillary, and your group. I love that. You know, I, I, you know, as you were talking, I can hear you moving through the concentric circles. Uh, and that's actually what we're going to go to next to kind of summarize a little bit. And we're going to leave some time for some little some Q&A as well. So we just have two more slides to share with you all. <clears throat> it's the one before. 
Thank you. So we just wanted to bring these two um, images back to you to talk about. And I heard it as you all were talking and I also read it in the slides. I went back to look at your Padlet responses and trying to figure out like, where is all this overlapping for you all? And this is what we wanted to actually bring to you today to give you another framework if you were not familiar with culturally relevant teaching and how you bring that you know, we keep saying like married and then connecting it together uh, with sustainability. And so we bring in about these two images to help you to think about a little bit more and also to see about an assessment of yourselves while you were in that particular group um, that you were talking about the different perspectives. And so here, um, and I'm just gonna mention the, the Padlets and then Denise, you can talk a little bit more about the circles as well, if you like. Um, but I went back to the Padlet and I was trying to see where along this kind of like continuum on were you all in your definitions of sustainability and you know and, and, and people tend to be at that point of the self and then you may jump to the world. And so but what does it mean to have that in between and how do we start to think about the issues around sustainability being much more broadly focused and again more complicated more, and, and oftentimes a little bit nuanced. And I think Hillary touched upon that even in her talk uh, that she just mentioned to us. But um, Denise, talk a little bit more because you were also in one of the groups and maybe you can talk about it too in, in connection to these to the uh, image on the left. And then I'm gonna summarize us all to talk about uh, culturally relevant teaching and then we're gonna open up for some Q&A. Yeah, so in, in the group that I was in, in terms of the indigenous um, communities, uh, you know, we mentioned about, you know, um, you know, what is happening to a lot of indigenous communities in terms of their displacement, um, being forced to relocate into areas where it doesn't uh, support their way of living because they've always, you know, historically for thousands of years, they've lived in sustainable um, uh, ways, doing sustainable practices in terms of their connection to nature. And so when you have it, when you're having, uh, when you have companies or multinational um, institutions that are sort of um, uh, engaging in these sort of behaviors that affects their way of life, then when you think about uh, what does this mean in terms of the, the, the larger um, picture in terms of the, 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 how it affects their, their air, quality, air quality and the spaces that they're living. But I also sort of really sort of highlighted the, the, the pedagogy and um, practices that are valuable to really sort of um, thinking about your students um, in terms of their critical consciousness about why these things are, uh, are happening. And I brought up the example of, let's say, Ikea, which, you know, they're known for cheap furniture, cheap-ish furniture. Where does this uh, come from? And, um, you know, why are they able to sell it so cheap? You know, so it's really sort of have students really sort of go uh, much deeper into <clears throat> looking at the behaviors and practices of, of institutions that trickle down and, and affect their communities. Uh, one of our group members, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, which, let me see if I can find her. She was in the group with uh, Tomer, uh, she's still here. Uh, she highlighted a, a project that, um, just for sake of time, that she's done with her students, she's uh, in, in Kentucky. And she, one of the, 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 the concerns she has is that, you know, they were doing a project-based um, activity, but it sort of stalled at some point where they, you know, where they were collaborated with um, an organization that was doing some environmental activism. And says sometimes, you know, you, you would come up against these barriers and we sort of talk about what ideas we could do to really sort of get the message out, broaden the, the scope of um, people being uh, uh, aware of what's happening um, in these issues. Because you, if, if um, you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone has heard of the, the, uh, the Flint water crisis, but, and, um, you know, at high asthma rates, of, and, and as we mentioned earlier, what happened in the Bronx, but there are also commun other communities that are uh, uh, being affected. So it's really sort of finding a platform where to elevate the message and so um, anyone would be able to have access to this information and uh, the power of social media to really sort of facilitate um, us being able to do that. 
So with all of this and, you know, and, and this, this workshop was really to get you, you can go back to the previous slide, um, Denise. Uh, yeah, I want to summarize the uh, culturally relevant um, pedagogy. So, you know, we introduced we introduced to you culturally relevant pedagogy or culturally uh, relevant teaching and the three tenets that Gloria Lawson Billings has for student achievement, cultural competence, and critical consciousness. So I just want you all to reflect about the role that you had in your particular breakout group. Did you touch upon these particular kinds of things? And so with the with the idea of being able to think about, you know, what is the learning and the motivation behind actually one of the things we do, like presenting data in front of students to be able to be uh, to know more and to learn. Uh, I'm sure some of you were able, as even Kiara's group number and, and two, talked about looking at data uh, around, that was um, relevant to each one of your all's um, countries and being able to have the conversation about that. That's what we want students to be able to do in terms of their student achievement. So if you put them into groups, how are they able to talk about their particular experiences and what they know? They bring that to the learning environment. Um, then you're also the, 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 looking at this real life data and then this idea of cultural competence. So they're able to learn about their countries, they're able about themselves, they're able to learn about the world and then and figuring out like, where's my place in all of this? Like, what is my, what is my role in all of this? And then asking critical questions um, that come out. You all have asked some critical questions in your, in, in, you know, in the um, information that you put on your individual slides, additional questions about your particular role. And then if, if students are able to kind of get that grounded in their education, then what does that mean when we look at these circles going back and forth between them all? Like what role will uh, um, uh, uh, the government play in these kinds of decisions that we're looking at? Well, then what role, you know, as the world, how do we are connected? We're on one world together. And I don't think we're all going to jump up and move them Mars tomorrow, right? So we're here and this is the world that we have and how do we um, um, think about its sustainability for now and also for the future. But all of this in the ways that Denise and I have been talking about and we love putting this presentation together is to think about now how does this transform our education? How does this transform our learning? How does this transform the way that students learn but also the way that teachers and instructors are able to teach? And so if we go to the next slide, Denise, we um, listed a, a few ways of being able to look at this in terms of the instruction that we have for students. Um, and so these are some different ways to be able to do that. So Denise, do you wanna comment about a couple of them? And then I'm gonna end with just one example. Right, as I mentioned, like at the beginning in terms of uh, uh, sustainability um, teachings and uh, cultural relevant pedagogy, it absolutely supports place-based and project-based learning. Uh, the way how you rethink um, your the structure of your lessons um, being more inquiry based, um, develop critical thinking skills. It's active, um, a sort of a, a learning environment that you're creating in your classrooms. So in in, in the teaching of science and the teaching of uh, sustainability practices, that to include not just the the environment, the the economics. So sometimes I think we may not look at the economic issues, but we look at the cultural, all these different components um, are married and we really sort of identify the strategies will help to support students being able to do these explorations to become more informed, better aware they are become um, problem solvers um, of their community. And we, we really need to think of our students as being able to do these things and what kind of supports can we provide um, to them to help to facilitate these, these changes. Uh, they're the ones that's going to inherit this planet. And so when we think about the, the, the long-term um, goals, what is it that they could do to really sort of um, facilitate um, these, these different um, uh, changes that we anticipate. So think of it in terms of pedagogically, what can I do as an instructor, as a teacher, as an educator to really sort of uh, provide the tools and the support to, to facilitate um, and shape the way how my students will think and do and become um, you know, problem solvers uh, of their communities. Mm -hmm. And then the last slide um, to sum this all up, is that once you engage students in all of this, they actually wanna take action. So I think as educators, we're gonna to have to be um, um, aware that this is gonna be a next step for a lot of students being young activists. And so I wanted to present this slide because this is a project that I did in the classroom actually over about a three, two, two year project that I did in elementary schools. 
And so this particular student, actually the class did, which also had natural, I call it natural integration toward literacy. They wrote letters to the New York City Department of Environmental Services to talk about wanting more green spaces in their neighborhood. They were learning about air pollution. They were learning about um, you know, the different ways that they can uh, have green spaces even in their neighborhood. They wrote letters about putting trees you know, in certain areas. Um, they talked about having places to play, you know, all these different things. And so they acted on the things that they were learning, the science that was presented to them, the data that was presented to them. And so they wrote these letters and their, their, um, their suggestions and ideas about how to improve their neighborhoods so that people could live much better, more safely. This was also connected because a lot of children in the school had asthma. So they were curious about, well, why do we have asthma? Why are students in the school absent all the time? So they were asking these questions. So it was like, well, let's figure this out. Let's learn about our environment. So I want you to be able to say like students are learning and they want to learn and they want to be activists and they be actively involved in trying to make the world better, um, their local context and the world at large. And so as educators, we have to be ready to go there with them, providing the resources and the learning environment that will promote these kinds of ways of doing that. And I totally believe you know, culturally relevant teaching is one way to do that. But now marrying it with these ideas around sustainability, I think it makes it even more of an example of transformative education. So thank you. Um, hopefully you all enjoyed and learned some things through, the, through this process that we have with you all going through. Thank you for your engagement. Um, we're gonna go back and continue look at your Padlet and look at the notes that you all had to also inform our learning. But we're gonna leave the last minutes that are open for any Q&A or just comments that anybody has. And thank you all for getting up early and being with us too. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Alicia, thank you so much. It's always nice to see how you can expand the border of uh, what is count as science education, because there's so much involved in the next generation science standard or in the uh, our guidelines for what is scientific reasoning, but without expanding the border of the system of the phenomena we are looking at, we will never reach sustainability. And I think you demonstrate it so well in this uh, event. Thank you. Thank you, Ori. You know, Thank I mean- you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, these ideas around the standards, you know, I've never paid let me, let me, let me, this is being recorded. So let me make sure, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, the standards puts us in little boxes, just like we are here in zoom. And we can't, we can't teach that way. I, I mean, get out of the box. You know, what are those ways? And, and I, again, I think this is where cultural relevant teaching really has really great connections to sustainability because we have really big issues that we need to address and the approaches that we've been taking for so many years in science education, and then I would argue probably in other fields, it's like, we're not, we're doing an injustice by not thinking outside of the box around these particular issues. And so we have to do that. So the standards that we have, the next generation scientists, and like, how can we look at those very differently? They don't, they, they're there. They don't tell us how to teach. They don't, they don't overlay theoretical perspectives or pedagogical perspectives. And so this is what we're trying to bring to that, uh, to be able to do that. But uh, thank you for that, Ari. Um, yeah, we got much work to do, but I, I find it to be exciting work that we have ahead of us. Yeah. I'd like to ask about the independence of teachers, especially in mm -hmm. primary school. How independent are they to have initiatives and um, how do you help them? <laughs> yeah, um, so my background is secondary, but I chose to work with elementary teachers because I see that so foundational. So that's where my research is. But it's been in the classrooms to help them to think about um, the practices that they have as elementary teachers because they're content, they're not content specialists, but they have other kinds of resources they are able to bring in. Uh, and so trying to marry that really uh, and offering them that support of the content, um, being able to give them data like we shared with you all today that's you know, like, how do you digest this and make sense of it for yourself? But then how do you make help to make 
how do you help your students to make sense of this data? But I find for elementary science education is really just supporting the teachers, um, helping them to uh, expand their ideas of what science is, because oftentimes they are very much in the box. But how do we help them to expand their ideas of what science is and what it looks like in the classroom? So there's much work that needs to be done. And so I'm even challenging our secondary um, 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 people to work with elementary teachers to support them, because eventually it has implications because these young people are going to come to you eventually, right? Right? And so we want them to be able to have a really great uh, foundational understanding, being able to have really great skills and um, knowledge uh, that they're going to carry with them into middle school, secondary schools, and into the college classroom learning. So we, I, I see this as part of that circle again, it's like they're, they're, we're all connected in this way of trying to be able to learn, but elementary um, teachers have, lot to, have lots to be able to offer us, and we have a lot to be able to support them in doing science at that grade level. I see a question from Oigoga. He's muted. No question. Uh -huh. Hello? Yes. Go ahead. Am I audible? Hello? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Good, good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon here. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, my name is uh, Onu Oigoga. Uh, quite a wonderful workshop, although I had little opportunity to contribute in the breakout session due to some challenges here. Uh, mm -hmm. Please, I would like to hear your view, Felicia. Uh, don't you think it will be more uh, uh, cost effective and if and efficient if uh, sustainability education or cultural based uh, sustainable education is kind of ingrained into a particular subject uh, for study in a particular school setting so that there will be uh, enough time to really research uh, topics that have been discussed by the teacher. Because um, from what I notice, it's more like studying the class, then go out to the class, outside the classroom and implement. And most of the times, uh, teachers don't do follow ups. And you find that projects uh, come to. What's your opinion? Do you think it will be cost effective? And uh, uh, efficient if sustainability education, uh, bordering on cultural uh, 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 competence, be done as a subject based uh, study. What's your opinion, please? Um, I think not. Um, and I think part of it has to do with my, my background in science. I came to science actually from industry uh, in, into education. And also the work that I do, I just um, answered a question earlier around uh, elementary education. Um, so elementary education, you know, teachers are um, generalists. They teach all the subject areas. And I wish we did that much more in middle and secondary and also at the college level. Um, they have much more of an integration around the things that we're learning. So not only in the science classroom, we're learning literacy skills, we're learning mathematical skills, we're learning all kinds of skills, um, even within the area of science. And I see this also within sustainability education. It's like the issues that we are covering, um, the concerns that we have are not, are not just solely within one area. And being able to get your English teacher to be able to help students to write arguments and argumentation, which is something we also have in science or getting the health teacher, you know, this data that we cover, you know, even though, you know, we say we're scientists, like a health educator can take on this data and also talk about it. So I think this is what we need to do much more of is not have a, a separation, but have much more of an integration of, of areas across different content areas and getting students to talk about it. Like, well, okay, we talked about this in our science class. Okay, we're gonna connect this in mathematics with a little bit more of the data and formulas, you know, uh, okay, now we're gonna go to health and talk about it. So. What happens if a school actually did that? Like there was a unit that was taught across all the content areas for efficiency, right? Uh, and so what, 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 how much more would students be able to learn? How much more engaged would they be? 
how much more even engaged would the teachers be? Because now they actually have a broader understanding of a particular issue. So no, I don't agree <laughs> uh, with that. I think I think we we should think about ways of making it much more integrated and expanded than in a particular content area, in my opinion. Okay. And I, as I mentioned, uh, sorry, I just want to add to that in terms of what sustainability pedagogy really supports uh, a much more interdisciplinary um, way of, of thinking. So we, uh, you know, we, we won't, we shouldn't think of um, the practices and the content and knowledge as being siloed um, to limit, limit, limited to just disciplines, but really sort of taking a much more um, transdisciplinary approach. Uh, in terms of what we want our students to become as um, problem solvers and um, to be activists, to develop these awareness for them to, to become better stewards of, of, uh, of these, these issues that uh, beset their communities. Mm -hmm. um, I know we have one more question from Hillary, but I, I will need to apologize. We have to wrap up, um, that's okay. I want to, I would like to thank Felicia and Denise for a wonderful workshop today. And thank you everybody for joining us from wherever you are. We are meeting again in two or three weeks on May 12th. We will send out flyer with invitation and links. Thank you everybody again. It was a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.